Hello and welcome back. The topic of this lecture is the thought of uh, Karl Marx. And I want to emphasize a couple of things right at the beginning. Uh, one of those is that Marx is very important. Um, uh, Marxist thought had a tremendous influence on the way that things have turned out. Uh, in fact, I think it's pretty well impossible to, to really understand the history of the entire 20th century without understanding at least something about Marx's thought. But the second thing I want to emphasize is uh, that understanding Marx's thought is very difficult. Um, that's partially because uh, Marx's writing was difficult. Um, also because Marx uh, frequently changed his mind about things uh, over the course of his life. And so uh, sometimes comparing one writing with another, the two will, will be inconsistent and it's, it's sort of hard to know uh, what's going on. And I guess understanding the change from one thing to another counts as understanding Marx. Um, and of course, uh, this is one of those issues that is uh, still uh, current in the sense that, uh, you know, people argue about uh, the, the the rightness or the wrongness of various kinds of Marxist ideas. Uh, and so it's harder to approach it with uh, an air of objectivity, um, uh, you know, without uh, without letting, uh, you know, what you've sort of heard about it or, um, you know, any sort of preconceived ideas influence uh, the way that you sort of read and understand what's, what's uh, going on here. So the uh, textbook principally concerns uh, a couple publications uh, by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, those being the Communist Manifesto of 1848 and uh, mostly the first volume of Das Kapital, which is uh, published in 16, or, sorry, 1867. Uh, there were a total of four volumes of Das Kapital, which is uh, supposed to be uh, Marx's you know, magnum opus, his great work. Um, and uh, the first one is heavily Marx, uh, with uh, Engels involved with a lot of editing. Uh, the second two were uh, written by Engels uh, from uh, notes by Marx, and then the fourth was written by uh, another person entirely, who, whose name I don't have in front of me and don't remember. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, Marx was the major idea man in terms of, uh, of, of what came to be called communist thought. Um, and uh, Engels was a, a, the much more organized writer, certainly. And so the two of them uh, tended to make a, a pretty good team. Uh, but uh, in general, I'll be referring uh, uh, mostly to the work of, of Marx. Uh, and I, I don't mean to, you know, sort of uh, uh, diminish anything that Engels contributed. So again, it's in, in order to understand Marx properly, uh, I think it's very important to understand the context in which uh, Marx arose. And that's one thing I'm going to try and add that I think uh, um, the, the, the textbook understandably leaves at least uh, in part out of the account. I think the textbook does a, a perfectly reasonable job of, of describing the basic outline of Marx's thought. Uh, but I think a better understanding can be given with a little bit more context as well. And so here we go. Uh, in, in a sense, uh, Marxism should be understood through the lens of at least three different kinds of revolution that were occurring uh, sort of both before and during his time, uh, those being political revolution in France, uh, intellectual revolution in Germany, and industrial revolution in Britain. And so Marx is, is a story of, 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 of revolutions all the way through. Uh, so let's take some of those, uh, take those in order. Uh, first off, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the French Revolution. Uh, if this is not a, a period of history with which you're very familiar, uh, ch check out a couple of quick YouTube videos or uh, or, or, or read up a little bit uh, in terms of its its broad outlines. It's a it's actually a, a quite a fascinating uh, story, and it's also very important to understand uh, most of European history uh, subsequently. Uh, but I'll, I'll summarize here so that, that uh, in a sense, what, what, I don't want to summarize the entire French Revolution, uh, but in a sense, what happened was that uh, uh, the monarchy was overthrown. Uh, there were several phases of the French Revolution, depending on sort of who, who had you know, come to power. Um, but uh, uh, there, there, there was a lot of lasting effects uh, once it was all said and done and once the dust settled. Uh, and those included the end of monarchy in France. France would never again, after the revolution was all said and done, have a king. Uh, although uh, there were a couple of emperors, Napoleon, both uh, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte and, and Napoleon III, uh, that would today count as military dictatorships. Um, it also uh, abolished feudalism in France, and uh, that's a, a process that uh, you know had already begun in some other places, but that would generally spread over uh, most of uh, Europe over over the course of the 19th century. 
Uh, feudalism, of course, is a, an economic structure where uh, the peasantry is tied to the land, right? They can't leave it, but they, they have to farm it and essentially uh, pay a portion of uh, of the produce, right, uh, to the, the, the lord, the feudal lord, um, for the privilege of working the land. Um, it's... Um, it's a tremendously unfair system, but uh, it, one of the things that uh, the revolution eventually did accomplish was essentially the abolition of that kind of economic system. It's a very important thing to keep in mind for Marx. And also, uh, uh, the French Revolution led to uh, certainly renounced titles of nobility in France uh, and began something of a trend uh, toward much more participatory government and much more equal society uh, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, although, again, some of these changes were slower in some places than others. Uh, but the French Revolution, in some ways, is is the beginning of a lot of those trends, uh, and those trends will be very important uh, to to think about Marx's context. If you think about a context in which Europe is in a transition from monarchy to you know away from monarchy, uh, uh, from you know feudalism into a more what we would call a, a kind of capitalist uh, system, um, from having uh, societies with very rigid social structures to societies with much more fluid social structures, like all of those things are very important developments uh, uh, to the context of Marx. Another very important element to Marx's context is the intellectual context in which he was raised. Uh, Marx himself was German. He studied philosophy in Germany um, and, uh, you know, intended to become a professor of philosophy in Germany. And uh, eventually, uh, he was unable to get uh, professorial positions, and he uh, did some journalism uh, while he was in Germany, and, and that didn't go particularly well. Uh, and so he eventually found himself in, in Britain. But, you know, again, uh, his background is all in German philosophy, and one of the most major figures in German philosophy in the generations leading up to Mark uh, was G.W.F. Hegel. Now I'll say this about Hegel. Hegel's philosophy is is, is tremendously difficult uh, to get a to get a grip on. Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, the the writing is difficult. The ideas are difficult, and there are many of them. Hegel wrote a lot of things about a lot of things. Uh, and so what I'm going to try give you here is the nickel version of one idea that Hegel had uh, that was very influential on Marx. So if you'll direct your attention here to this uh, leftmost diagram, uh, this is a diagram of what uh, Hegel uh, called uh, the, the dialectic process. Um, now, di the word dialectic is, is related to the word dialogue or, or conversation, in other words. And this is uh, an idea that's not that's not brand new to philosophy. Uh, if you think all the way back to Plato, all of Plato's writings were dialogues. They were conversations between people. And so uh, philosophers have long taken various kinds of ideas and played them off of one another and trying to trying to figure out what's true and trying to figure out what's right and, you know, balancing one kind of a concern against another, you know, there's an argument and a counter argument and then a counter argument to the counter argument and so on and so forth. That's all common philosophical practice. The thing that makes Hegel's ideas about this sort of unique and interesting is that he thought there was a kind of necessity to the way that ideas sort of fought with each other and then produced new ideas. Um, and, and very loosely, that process is described in the following way here. Uh, you, you know, it, you start with a thesis, right? So some particular idea. And that idea just naturally brings about uh, th something that opposes it, that is the antithesis, right? Um, and then what happens is as those two ideas sort of, you know, fight it out and interact with each other, the, the, they'll, they'll form a kind of synthesis that'll take on some aspects of each of them. Uh, and of course, that can form a new thesis, which will generate its own antithesis, which will, you know, sort of duke it out and make their own synthesis, which becomes its own thesis, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. So sometimes... Uh, uh, this is described as more of a spiral uh, from thesis to antithesis to synthesis and, and sort of uh, around and around and around. And so the idea sort of progresses, it sort of moves down the run. Um, and again, the, the thing that makes this idea of Hegel's really distinctive is that Hegel seemed to think that there was a way that that process had to come about. It's not just that people do, as a matter of fact, uh, play ideas off against another till they get a new one and then play off ideas against that one. That's, again, that's, that's normal philosophical understanding. Um, 
uh, Hegel's idea was that there was a, a kind of necessity to it, like it had to go a certain way, right? Certain ideas had to bring about certain other ideas. Um, in fact, uh, the way that uh, Julie Maybe, who wrote the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia entry on Hegel's dialectics, puts it this way. Uh, she says, indeed for Hegel, the movement from one idea to another is driven by necessity. The natures of the determinations themselves drive or force them to pass into their opposites. This sense of necessity, the idea that the method involves being forced from earlier moments to later ones, leads Hegel to regard his dialectics as a kind of logic. Right, and when 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 uh, uh, maybe he says a kind of logic, uh, think back to early in the course where if you have a claim, right, say if A then B, and then you have another claim A, you kind of have no choice but to conclude B. It's that kind of necessity that Hegel thought was really going on uh, with uh, theses, uh, you know, uh, uh, forcing them into to pass into their opposites and form a new synthesis and all that stuff, right? Um, and so. Like I said, that's a tremendously complicated idea, and this is a very, uh, very overly simple uh, representation of it, but it'll do. The way that this Hegelian idea influenced Marx is in Marx's view of history. So just as uh, Hegel believed that certain kinds of ideas necessarily uh, uh, you know, combined with their opposites to form new syntheses, which again, combined with their opposites, but he, he, again, with this sort of, uh, there was a place where it was all going and had to go and you just had to follow it all the way through. Uh, Marx develops this kind of view of history, not just of philosophy. Uh, that is, that Marx uh, uh, thought that there was a way that history sort of had to turn out based on the kind of conflicts uh, that were uh, that were historical. That, that you know, the, um, he thought of history as a kind of story of class conflict, uh, where it sort of had to start a certain way, it had to continue a certain way, and it had to end up a certain way. Uh, and so uh, at, at uh, Marx's funeral, uh, the following words were uh, delivered by Friedrich Engels. He said, just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human history. Uh, you know, Marx and his followers really, really believed that uh, you could treat history like science, right? You could treat historical events as data. You could come up with natural laws that explain how history changes over time, just like you can come up with natural laws to explain how biological life changes its form over time, which is, of course, what, uh, what, what Darwin famously uh, explained. And so um, I, at first glance, this seems like it's uh, very sensible. You say, well, yeah, of course, you know, uh, things in history happen for a reason. And if we understand those reasons, then we can uh, avoid the bad things in history and seek out the good things and, and you know, um, and uh, keep history from repeating itself in, in bad ways. But we want it to repeat itself in the good ways and all that sort of stuff. And, and that's fair, right? Certainly we can learn from the past in ways that can influence our future. Um, but most historians do not regard what they do as a science in the sense that there are laws of history, that things had to turn out the way that they in fact did turn out. Uh, in fact, uh, history is full of, of times where nobody would have predicted the way things in fact did turn out, and the way that they did turn out uh, are the result of a lot of very random factors uh, that don't represent law-like relations at all. Uh, so modern historians do not tend to regard history uh, in this scientific way. Uh, this, this view is, is very distinctive of Marx. And so uh, his specific story, and this is again the nickel version of it, this is the very simplified version, um, it starts, It starts. you know, he says in, in sort of primitive uh, times, right? He thinks that, that uh, early, early human beings lived in what he called uh, an era of primitive communism where society is very unorganized, but there's this conflict between persons all over the place about the division of labor, about private property, uh, and, you know, conflicts between tribes and, and clans or, you know, stuff like that that eventually uh, what coalesces all of that stuff is something like empire right that is somebody some some strong man gets gets you know to sort of power uh, organizes uh, groups of people that can can organize beyond the levels of just families or tribes or something like that and uh, that's effectively empire and of course empire has this conflict with barbarians um, which uh, 
uh, if you if you read a lot of histories of uh, the Roman Empire, for example, uh, you'll see that there's this uh, sort of story about how it's all just Romans versus barbarians. That's a tremendously oversimplified picture of what was going on, and it's likely that that's never really been true. But again, we'll skip some of that for now. Um, and uh, this is what leads to uh, what he calls the sort of era um, uh, era of slavery, right? Uh, because of course, uh, many ancient uh, uh, civilizations like you know, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, uh, they had slaves. A lot of those slaves were military slaves. That was that it were conquered peoples, things like that. Uh, and of course, you've got this conflict, and it eventually uh, resolves itself into something that he recognized from his own nearer history: uh, this era of feudalism, in which there's this landed aristocracy that owns instead of owning people the way that uh, that sort of ancient uh, ancient uh, 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 Imperials did right. Uh, then it, it, instead, what happens is uh, these these nobles they own the land, and then the peasants are tied to the land, right? And uh, the idea is in this uh, in this kind of a problem, you've got this conflict, right, uh, with uh, the bourgeoisie, this sort of this middle class that starts to arise. Uh, there's also a conflict between sort of the peasants, the the, the the people who are doing all the work, and then of course the people that own all this land that is uh, responsible for all the production. And then after this era of feudalism is supposed to come this era of capitalism, uh, where uh, you have this bourgeois democracy is in conflict with uh, the proletariat, this new working class. Uh, we'll talk about the, the 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 words proletariat and bourgeoisie in a minute here. Those are very important uh, vocab words for thinking about Marx. And uh, eventually what was going to happen is all that conflict between the bourgeois and the proletariat was supposed to eventually lead to this proletarian rule after some you know, long series of revolutions uh, and some development of uh, essentially a communistic utopia. So that's where he thought it was going and he thought there was reasons it had to go there uh, because he thought he had this, this scientific theory of history and many, many other people thought he did as well. So the, the third part of context that I want to talk about is the context of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is the third of the revolutions that had a, a strong influence on Marx and Marxism. And I'll say this, that uh, again, I can't give you an entire breakdown of the Industrial Revolution. If this is not a period you've studied much, uh, you should look up a few things about it. It's, it's also very fascinating. Uh, but we'll suffice it to say for now that the Industrial Revolution brought about very rapid change in European life, uh, most especially increased urbanization. That is, uh, lots of people moved to cities. The cities grew. Uh, you know, people were moving out of the countryside in numbers that were uh, sort of unheard of in times before, uh, because you know, times before industrialization, almost everybody was involved in some sense in agriculture. Uh, almost everybody was uh, sort of, you know, had a, had a kind of pastoral or, or a, a, a lifestyle based on agronomy. Uh, and so uh, the Industrial Revolution started to really change that and change it rapidly. Uh, it also replaced an economy of exchange and debt with an economy of currency. Um, most ordinary people uh, in the pre-industrial period wouldn't necessarily have dealt much with currency. I mean, there were sort of ancient coins and things like that, but again, ordinary folks wouldn't have used them all that much for their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, really what happened is they had these sort of informal systems of, of, of debts, right? Um, and, uh, and would you know often pay in kind for things uh, or would work out, work out various kinds of exchanges that sort of tended to work uh, for uh, you know agricultural village life. Uh, and uh, the the again the industrial period really sort of sweeps a lot of that away and sweeps it away fairly quickly uh, to an economy of currency where everybody's dealing with sort of you know coins and bills and things like that. Um, also, uh, it replaced agronomy, that is uh, agriculture uh, and handcraft, right? Uh, that is, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to, uh, to to buy a cart, you were probably going to uh, buy it from somebody who made the whole cart by themselves, right? Um, and that's 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 handcraft, right? Or if you want a table, somebody built the whole table by themselves. Um, you know, that's the way that things used to get made, right? By by sort of essentially individuals. You know, maybe there's a little bit of cooperation between a couple, three people, but uh, it's small scale. Uh, and and of course, uh, once you bring factories, assembly lines, all that stuff into the picture, that changes very very radically and rapidly. 
Uh, and so handcraft and agronomy get replaced with manufacturing. And uh, importantly for Marx, uh, it created a couple of, of new economic classes of people, uh, classes of people that really didn't exist before the Industrial Revolution. One of those uh, that he called the proletariat, really you could call it the worker class, really the factory worker class, right? This, these are people who lived in cities and who worked for wages in mines or factories or something like that. Uh, this is distinct from agricultural laborers uh, who have existed for you know many thousands of years, uh, and uh, uh, Marx did not consider them part of the working class, uh, even though they did labor for their living and they did have they did work for a wage. Uh, he, he was thinking of industrial workers when he talks about the pro the proletariat. Uh, in fact, uh, what to do about agricultural uh, sort of you know peasants or or laborers uh, was something that you know many thinkers of the time. Uh, very much disagreed with, and it's it's hard to hard to at some points, you know, Marx thought that they could be great allies to to the you know to, to communism, and other times he thought that they were the enemies of of communism. It was, you know, it's it's one of those things that's really hard to say, but it's important to consider. Um, uh, and then, of course, the other uh, important vocab word here is the uh, this this word for this sort of new middle class, uh, uh, this uh, bourgeoisie, as as uh, it's often called in uh, this kind of literature. Uh, so these are people who, uh, for the most part, do not own a lot of land if they own any. Uh, they don't necessarily they aren't they aren't necessarily nobility almost you know almost exclusively not. Uh, but they have a lot of money uh, from from uh, some of these early uh, you know commercial activities you know as as a sort of merchants and factory owners and and, and business people. That's the uh, this the sort of new financial middle class uh, that is again a very new thing in the industrial revolution and so those are all things that that uh, in, in, introduce a kind of newness and transition uh, that that Marx has thought will will absolutely become a big part of one of the major issues that Marx had with the Industrial Revolution um, that uh, you can read a lot in the text uh, uh, and uh, uh, we'll cover, we'll summarize it just a little bit here, uh, is this notion of alienation. Um, uh, this image here is actually from a, a, a movie made in the 1920s. I want to say 1927, if I remember right. The movie's called Metropolis, which again, it's worth seeing if you can uh, uh, get a look at it. It's a, it's a very interesting, uh, very artistic film. Uh, and uh, you're like, this is 1927. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a kind of a, it's a kind of a classic for a reason. Um, but you get this uh, sense in here. It's a, it, you know, the, the movie itself was, I think, very heavily influenced by Marxist thought. Uh, because it, you've got this portrayal of industrial work as as very dehumanizing, right? A, a person is is just another cog in the machine. They're all replaceable. Um, you know, everybody in this film who's a worker, they're all sort of marching in lines, wearing the same clothes, doing these repetitive, soul-crushing things. Uh, you know, sort of uh, doing work in what looks more like a prison environment than uh, than a workplace that anybody would be happy to go to. Um, and this is this was this was a, a common idea of, of industrial work, and I think a lot of it probably wasn't very nice. Um, and uh, and Marx's argument is that this kind of industrial work, that is where people are just doing repetitive tasks over and over again, and they're 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 just a replaceable part in the machine themselves, uh, it sort of alienated them from their work and alienated them from each other. That's the sense of alienation here, um, and that's um, that's. That's one of the major problems that, that Marx had with uh, industrial work. One of the other big problems that Marx had with industrial work is, uh, is, is in terms of exploitation, right? And so this is one of Marx's most interesting arguments. Um, and it's an, an argument that that profit is just basically is exploitation. I wanted to walk you through again, I'm gonna give you the nickel version, the, the sort of overly simple version of, of this argument. So um, imagine uh, that you've got a, a, you know, a factory and you want to make a product, right? One of the things you're going to need to do is you're going to need to pay uh, whoever's you know, digging out and refining all the raw materials. You need the raw materials, you got to pay for those. And so you pay your money for the, that stuff, you've got all your raw materials. Okay, great. You got to pay somebody to design something. So uh, maybe if, you're, if, you're, if your product is an electronics gadget, you've got to pay a bunch of electric engineers uh, to, to do all the design work. And you know, that's, that's, you know, that's going to cost some 
money, so you got to pay them the money. So you do that. And then, of course, uh, you, once you've got your design and you got your raw materials, you actually have to build the thing. Um, and uh, so, of course, you're going to have to pay people to, to work in a factory to do, you know, all the assembly and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then uh, you're, you know, once you've got a product, of course, you've got to you've got to market that product and you've got to move it. And so you're going to pay some more people to work on packaging and marketing strategies and advertising, uh, distributing distribution, all that sort of stuff that, that's required to get a product out of the market. Now, of course, now, boom, you've got a product out on the market. Okay. And so then you're going to sell all of that product and say you sell your whole run of production. Uh, you're going to have a bunch of money. And uh, the, the, the idea is that the money that you get from that product is going to be greater than all of the total of the money that you've paid out for the raw materials, the design, the manufacture, and uh, all the sort of marketing and distribution and everything like that. So you've got money left over. That's what we call profit. OK, um, and you're like, OK, that sounds fine. What's wrong with that? And well, there may not be anything wrong with that. Uh, but Mark certainly thought there was something wrong with that. And he thought, OK, if you've got all this leftover money, what that necessarily must mean is that somebody in this process, possibly everybody in this process, to a greater or lesser extent, is getting stiffed. That is, that they were underpaid for what they contributed. Because if you take, you know, the total thing, so say, you know, your your your, your cell phone made you, you know, a billion dollars or something like that, and you only paid out five hundred million dollars to all these various parties, well, what's going on is there's five hundred million dollars then worth of unpaid, uh, sort of, you know, uh, underpaid labor, you should say. Right? Right? That, that somebody has provided something that's worth, right? that altogether these, these contributions were worth a billion dollars, they didn't get paid a billion dollars for it. Right? And when you put it that way, you're like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> you, know, you might say, okay, well, you know, so somebody who, you know, who, who had the idea for the product to begin with, maybe they should uh, you know, get rewarded. But it's like, um, you know, maybe, but, but again, if things aren't balancing out, right, then, then, then there's some kind of, uh, somebody's taking advantage of somebody uh, somewhere along the line. And, and, and Marx was very suspicious of this kind of a thing. And uh, uh, it's, again, it's a very, very interesting argument. Now, part of, the, uh, part of the trouble with this argument is that it sort of assumes that, that, that all labor is equally valuable, which it, it isn't. Um, uh, you know, just a, a quick illustration. I mean, I, a, a world-class chef uh, could take some dough and some apples and, and make you something absolutely delicious, uh, you know, with, with very little effort. Uh, whereas uh, somebody like, um, I'm, I'm sorry about this if you're watching, but my brother, who doesn't, certainly doesn't, I'm not sure he's ever baked anything in his life, could probably take those apples and that dough and spend all day turning it into an inedible mess, okay? And so, uh, again, work all by itself or labor all by itself isn't necessarily valuable. Um, and so there's a sense in which some of this inequality is, is uh, in, in terms of what, you know, what certain labor is worth is justified. Um, but there's the sneaking suspicion that, that, that it's in some ways just being exploitative. Now, one other thing I want to say about this argument is that uh, in, in, a moder in a modern setting, right, when we think of most business, at least large business as corporate business, if there is profit, it tends to go uh, to the shareholders of a big company. And uh, there's some, you know, I, I, that's the kind of thing, you know, Marx would say, of, you know, of course, it, you know, it's going to the people who already have, you know, money to stake on these kinds of things and, you know, widening class divisions in society. Again, would be very suspicious about that. But of course, it's not the only way to organize things. And uh, we certainly do have organizations like workers co-ops or what are called employee-owned businesses where that profit uh, then at, after, at once all is said and done, that profit gets shared out in between the employee owners or you know in between the workers if it's a, a workers co-op, um, which would seem to sort of short circuit um, uh, Marx's argument. That would seem to be the sort of thing that Marx would argue that, that should happen. And um, if you if you interpret it that way, it's like well okay maybe maybe that really should be what happens. But but in any case, it's a very interesting argument, uh, and it's one that uh, again plays a central role uh, in Marx. Marxist thought. And of course, uh, one of the other things to keep in mind about um, about the effect of the Industrial Revolution on Marxist thought is the conditions that people were both living and working in during the early Industrial Revolution especially. Um, and I, I should say that it's important not to romanticize pre-industrial working conditions. Uh, it's not like those were any picnic either. Um, but it's, it's true that many aspects of early industrial labor were just morally odious, uh, including things like child labor, as, as some of the, these photographs um, uh, sort of you know, illustrate uh, very long hours, uh, 
low wages, almost universally wages below subsistence level that is below the level that people could really survive on, um, and uh, very dangerous working conditions uh, that uh, there was not very much incentive to correct, right? Um, and uh, very shabby living conditions in the uh, cities uh, for, for the people doing this work. Uh, again, many of them children, um, in some cases because their parents had already died or become disabled doing such work. Um, and so, yeah, again, there's a there's a lot to dislike about um, about early industrial working conditions, um, and uh, those kinds of problems uh, very much uh, fed uh, a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with the whole system uh, of, of you know factories and factory owners and all that sort of stuff. So that's certainly something uh, that Marx and uh, those who uh, would would follow Marx uh, took a took a strong note of and took exception to for reasons are entirely understandable. And so what all that adds up to, all that alienation, exploitation, and just, you know, horrid working conditions uh, leads leads to the idea that at some point, uh, something's got to give, right? Or, or in the, the, the words of Herb Stein, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Um, and uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, again, Marx was convinced that as the proletariat grew in size, and he, he predicted it would, and, and he was right, it did, uh, that its lot would worsen. To some extent, uh, things got uh, sort of pretty bad before they started to improve, and, and so to, to an extent, he was right about that as well. Um, and he thought the power of the, the this working class, this proletariat, would grow until just the inevitable overthrow of the whole system, and then the abolition of private property, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, that, for the most part, uh, never did happen. And so when we talk about what sort of did and didn't happen uh, after Marx's time, uh, it, it, it's pretty complex. And um, again, I can't tell you the entire story. I can only really give you the simplified nickel version. The text gives you some related information. Uh, but I think it's important to, to consider that Marx's legacy has been really quite complex in a lot of different ways. Um, and so one thing to certainly mention is uh, the result of many of the political revolutions that Marxist thought inspired and some of the political systems that, that arose as a result. Um, and uh, Marxist revolutions have tended not to have a particularly good uh, record over, over, over the long haul. Uh, so a lot of movements that were Marxist, at least in name, have shown a tendency to result in repressive dictatorships. Again, I put this at least in name business because I think it, it is fair to say that a lot of the political systems that arose uh, out of Marxist revolutions were not in and of themselves particularly Marxist in all ways, uh, and that Marxist thought really did, uh, you know, was was adapted by lots of different people in lots of different ways. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, if you're just curious, it, it, here's the thing, you, you have to turn in your 20th century history card if you can't name at least three of these four uh, people from their photographs. Um, but, uh, but it, you know, in case you're, you're you just to avoid, have to look those up, uh, this is the uh, first supreme leader of, of North Korea. Uh, here's, of course, Joseph Stalin, uh, the sort of dictator of the uh, early Soviet Union. Um, this is Tito, um, uh, sort of Yugoslavian dictator. And uh, this is, this is uh, Mao, uh, sort of, you know, essentially dictator uh, of, of early China. Uh, and uh, all of them have really complex legacies, uh, of some of them tremendously uh, bloody and authoritarian, uh, probably none more so than Stalin. And uh, like I said, this is not exactly um, a Mount Rushmore that you'd, you'd, you'd love to visit uh, historically or otherwise. Uh, and so uh, that's certainly fair to mention. Um, and I, I don't know how much uh, blame you really want to put at the feet of, of Marx for this. That's a major, you know, majorly controversial question. Uh, but it's certainly worth mentioning that, that that is part of the part of the calculus. That is part of the story. But of course, it's not the only part of the story. Um, uh, certainly one of the things to happen in the wake of, uh, you know, a lot of, of socialist and communist thought, a lot of Marxist thought, in other words, uh, is a, a, a kind of organized labor movement. Uh, and that's not just labor unions, but also political parties that are, are, are formed and founded around uh, workers' rights and workers' conditions. Uh, for example, the Labor Party, uh, which, you know, has run Great Britain for much of the, uh, for much of its uh, recent history. Um, 
and, 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 you know, labor parties in many, many other places and labor demonstrations, uh, you know, that, that really have served to uh, make the lot of the ordinary working person very, very much better over time. Uh, that also is part of the context. And again, how much credit you want to give Marx for this? Uh, it's hugely controversial, uh, but again, it is part of the story. Uh, one of the trends that makes Marx's legacy uh, really complicated is that uh, the, the kinds of uh, huge and bloody revolutions and sort of, you know, giant whole scale teardowns of the system that he saw uh, really never did happen in most places. Uh, there were communist revolutions in some places, not where he expected them to be, of course, but uh, there were some. Uh, but more than more often, uh, those things continue to fail to happen. And one of the reasons for that is that over time, uh, governments became much more participatory in the sense that they allowed sort of more people to have a say in how things were going. Um, and even governments today are, are still uh, in, moving in the direction of increased participation. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, no, no society is, of course, perfect in this regard, but uh, the societies we have now, the governments we have now, most just about worldwide, uh, are much better than the kind uh, that existed, certainly in Marx's day and um, even in some of the decades following his death. Um, so, for example, in, in, in the, you know, the UK, uh, various reform acts of 1832, 67, and 84 expanded male franchise uh, before eventually giving the vote to, uh, to, to women as well, making the franchise more or less universal. Uh, in the US, the 15th Amendment removed racial restrictions on voting, even though there were uh, things like poll taxes and literacy tests and things like that. There was still voting discrimination, but uh, the legal barrier based on race was removed by the 15th Amendment. Uh, the 17th Amendment in 1920 uh, gave women voting rights. Uh, and again, and, and, and franchise has continued to more or less expand from there. Uh, the majority of Germans were given suffrage in 1848, uh, with again, steady expansion uh, thereafter to other more and more segments of society. And that trend has continued in, in you know, again, throughout most of Europe and uh, indeed throughout most of the world. Uh, most governments are much more participatory now than they were 150 years ago. And so that in itself has tended to lead to the kinds of, of, ref, of to, to reform of the kinds of horrible problems that, that drove Marx to think that eventually people would just have enough and uh, would essentially overthrow the whole system. Uh, instead, the system was changed largely from within in most places. And so, again, another thing that's part of the story is uh, the, the rise of public goods and uh, of the welfare state, especially in, uh, in, in Europe and most of the uh, parts of the world that industrialized earliest. Um, the, uh, the notion behind uh, the, the, the welfare state is uh, that uh, th there's a certain safety net, right? There's a, a, a level below which uh, the, the state takes an interest in trying to let, you know, trying to prevent people from falling below. Uh, so various kinds of food assistance, um, uh, you know, things like social security, uh, public pensions, um, you know, those kinds of systems have uh, sort of eliminated the economic necessity for people uh, to sort of work themselves to death and have provided a kind of safety net to make sure that um, uh, the, the worst uh, can, can be at least avoided or mitigated. And, and those things have been in general, successful. Again, nothing's perfect, but uh, but overall, standards of living really have been really have benefited uh, from these kinds of uh, these kinds of measures. Further, lots of aspects of life have been removed from the market uh, system that is removed from the free market. They're not free market things anymore. They're things that are run as public goods. And so I'm thinking specifically in terms of the things pictured here are things like uh, hospitals. Um, again, in most industrial, uh, most of the places where industry uh, happened first, so like Western Europe, North America, those places, most of most most places there uh, have uh, have a kind of state run health service uh, where uh, health care is, is not something that that is left to a marketplace. It's left. Uh, it's instead provided as a public good, uh, which again has a, a strong influence on the standard of living uh, that people have uh, in, in those systems. Uh, this here is a, a photo from from Britain, their their National Health Service, of which they're uh, justifiably quite proud. 
And also uh, education, another thing that uh, throughout most of human history has been in a private marketplace, that is, you can have it if you pay for it, uh, has been moved into the public sphere and run uh, essentially by the state as a kind of public good. Uh, again, uh, saying that, you know, it's an acknowledgement that, that, that all citizens need to be able to be given the opportunity to fully participate in their society. And that is a kind of idea that is at least consonant uh, with some of the things that animated Marx, right? He, he thought that the kind of exclusion and exploitation of the lower classes by the upper classes was something that, you know, it just couldn't continue and, and shouldn't continue. Um, and uh, due in large part to some of these things that have been removed from markets, uh, that they, they become part of the story of the legacy of uh, both uh, socialist and, and communist thought. Uh, even though it's, uh, you know, again, how much is, is, a, is a large controversy. One of the other reasons why uh, a lot of the uh, problems that Marx saw in his own day uh, tend, tended to get better over time rather than worse over time, as he thought, uh, is again because uh, governments uh, increasingly regulated markets, uh, right? Whether it be uh, breaking up monopolies, as the United States did with uh, the Bell Telephone system. It's a story if you're not familiar with, you should look that one up. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, things like uh, you know regulations of of, of health and safety, uh, especially in the food industry. You know, health inspections are, are are a major role that government plays uh, that help to avoid some of the worst problems with just leaving things to the market and just letting the market take care of itself. Uh, there are too many motives for cutting corners in terms of worker safety and even customer safety, uh, but uh, that's one of the things that government regulation does. And of course, uh, many of the uh, prosecutions of bad action uh, uh, among, um, you know, private business in terms of exploitation or fraud or dishonesty or, you know, various the various kinds of cheating uh, that tend to harm society, uh, there are whole, you know, uh, arms of, of government prosecutors, mm -hmm. prosecutors that work for, for governments uh, that uh, tend to take on those kinds of cases to, to make the system uh, a little bit better for everybody. And again, nobody does their job exactly perfectly, um, but uh, it's much better than, than not having these kinds of roles take place. And so again, that is uh, also part of the story. And that's part of why some of the things that Marx thought would continue to get just worse and worse uh, have instead actually gotten quite a lot better. Finally, let's talk a little bit about inequality because this was uh, one of Marx's other complaints about capitalism uh, and, and early industrial capitalism uh, more specifically, is that it tended to uh, foster a lot of wealth inequality. And uh, that's still true. Uh, that's that's one thing that, again, Marx uh, was, was very much right about, is that a kind of capitalist industrial system does tend uh, to increase uh, uh, in wealth inequality over time. And in fact, uh, some of this data is a very helpful infographic comes from uh, a, a talk by uh, Dan Ariely. You can sort of look it up here. Um, and and what Ariely says is, is that if you, if you ask people, um, you know, uh, what kind of, of division of, of, of wealth do you think is, is fair in a society? Notice, uh, this is the what we want area here. Notice people don't opt for a perfectly equal distribution, right? They think that the top 20% should have, you know, say about 31.9% on average of the total wealth and that, you know, they think there should, there's, there should be some reasons for some inequality. After all, not everybody has the same cool ideas or, uh, or perhaps works as hard for them. And so, you know, you know, if there's, if there's some merit behind some of that inequality and they should expect that there would in general be at least some, then they can tolerate some inequality. And this is, this is the what we want area. Of course, this is what we think we have. If you survey people, uh, like how unequal do you think our society really is? Uh, they think it's it's a lot like this, where you know where the uh, the the wealthiest twenty percent tend to have about sixty percent of the wealth, and the second twenty percent has twenty percent, and the third has twelve, and the fourth has something like you know I would call that around six, and then this has like two or three uh, in the bottom twenty percent. Actually, actually, this is what we have, where where the bottom forty percent aren't really visible uh, on the graph at all; they have so little, uh, and then the third. 20% has, you know, just a few percent of the total wealth. And then the, then the, the second best 20% of the population has about 11% of the wealth. And then all the rest of it's all collected up here in the top 20%. And so that's a lot of wealth inequality. And that has over time kind of increased. Uh, 
uh, and in some places is still increasing, uh, and that does tend to be a uh, that that does tend to be a tendency of uh, industrial capitalism, uh, and it's something that even people to this day are, are quite concerned about, and and a way in which you might say, well, you know, Marx was not wrong there. Um, Although, of course, it's more complicated than, than just this. Uh, I certainly think it's true that we have a more unequal society than most of us think we have. And it's also true that we have a more unequal society than we want. Uh, but the story is somewhat more complicated with respect to inequality, uh, as, as we'll see on the next slide. Here we see a couple of uh, really cool infographics that, uh, again, I know you can't read any of this text, and that's okay. Uh, I, I just want to sort of broadly point at a couple of these things. Uh, you can look at the, the full write-up here uh, from a, a, a wonderful, wonderful website called Our World in Data. Uh, and if you can't, if you're not the sort of person that can spend hours upon hours upon hours in Our World on Data, you should be. <laughs> it's fantastically interesting stuff, and they have you know really cool infographics about almost anything you'd care to learn a lot about um, that that really point out some just interesting things about the world we live in. And so there's a couple of things I want to say about, about inequality here. So one of those is, is I'm going to point to this sort of rightmost diagram first. And this basically shows a... Um, uh, a kind of distribution of world uh, uh, wealth, and, and I know these numbers are really tiny, so I'll tell you what they say. Uh, these, uh, this, this says that you know this is uh, 0.2, this is 0.5, this is one dollar, two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, right? So this is this is income per daily income per capita, and so imagine imagine earning less than a dollar a day. Okay, well that's the equivalent of that is how people in the 1800, like almost everybody in the world in 1800 lived. And you say, well, look, things were cheaper back then. No, 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 no. This chart takes that into account. It takes into account that things were that much cheaper, right? So like you, you so when you say you're living on a dollar a day in 1800, that's like living on a dollar a day in Miami or 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 Memphis or St. Louis or whatever today, right? That's They've adjusted for inflation already. Uh, and so you think, God, how did people live that way? Well, I mean, people were very, very poor by modern standards. In fact, this little line here, this is with, with the international poverty line, is it's set at about $2 a day. Anybody living today in today's world below $2 a day is what we would call in extreme poverty. right? And notice that's basically the entire world in 1800. Okay, So that's pre-industrial time. Um, by 1975... Uh, areas that had industrialized had made themselves immeasurably wealthier, right? I mean, like, like you know, 10, 50 times, you know, wealthier than, than pretty much everybody in the 1800s. Um, but, uh, or at least in 1800, the early, you know, uh, the early part of that century. Uh, but, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of people sort of left behind, right? Those who, who didn't industrialize quite as much or quite as fast as, uh, as Western Europe, some parts of North America and, uh, and, and the Pacific. So like in Australia, New Zealand, those, some of those places. Um, and so in, in 75, you had a very strike, striking division between two very different ways of life. Uh, one was called the first world, right? These are, these are capitalist industrial countries. Another was called the second world, which were communist industrial countries, um, uh, who also sort of fit in here. And, um, and, and then, of course, uh, largely unindustrialized countries, which, which are, are largely here. And so they call that the third world. Now, people still use the term third world and first world to describe uh, things in the world, even though that no longer actually makes sense, uh, because this is what the world looks like in 2015. Those, those, those humps have disappeared. They're gone now. Um, and so what we have is we have essentially this bell curve uh, where almost the entire world is, is industrialized to some extent or other, um, except for very, very small little isolated pockets here or there, uh, not whole countries, certainly. So notice the, the, that overall, the entire world has gotten much richer. Now, only, only a small minority of, of, of the people in the world live in uh, extreme poverty. Um, and so when you hear people talk about you know, eliminating world poverty, uh, that's not a pie in the sky notion like it was here, where most of the world's population still lives in extreme poverty. Here, it's actually a, min a significant minority of the world's population that lives in extreme poverty. And so that's, that's a lot. Um, that's a just a, that's a horse of a different color, as they say. Um, that's uh, that's not crazy to talk about eliminating um, extreme poverty in the world, um, not anymore. And so, in any case, uh, industrialization has brought a great deal of wealth to everybody. In addition to bringing a lot of wealth inequality, and so everybody's immeasurably richer. 
especially the super rich who are immeasurably more super rich than 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 anybody than any super rich people used to be so it's um it, it, it's a complicated issue that you know that it appears as if as if you know uh, industry has kind of uh, given given and taken with you know with the same hand but one other thing I want to mention is uh, that the inequality isn't uh, sort of the end of the story. Uh, this this uh, uh, chart here on the left shows the difference between um, in just pure income inequality. They say sort of market income uh, inequality in a, in a variety of places. And so, uh, again, the further right on you are on this chart, the more unequal. OK, the further left, the more equal. And so uh, most incomes uh, are, are fairly unequal. There's, that is, there's places where like the, the, the income difference between one, one person and another on average is, it can be very high. Um, however, that's not the end of the story. Uh, almost everywhere in the world has what's called a progressive income uh, tax, which means that, that uh, people who, who have much higher incomes are taxed at higher rates than people who have lower incomes. And if you have a low enough income, you're not really taxed at all in most places. And so as a result of that, you take all this, this you know, sort of rather unequal wage earning. And after redistribution, it kind of falls into a line uh, sort of all the way over here uh, where, where um, you know, after taxes, essentially things look much more equal. Uh, and so the, the the whole idea of like you know progressive tax rates or you know the, having a government take uh, equality seriously and really the concept of redistribution due to taxation is a kind of idea that that I think Marx would have wholly approved of if he had thought uh, that uh, you know the that, that governments could be trusted with such a thing which he sort of didn't he sort of thought no 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 you've got to throw the whole system away you've got to revolt you've got to you know break it all to bits and abolish private property and you know completely abolish the kinds of governments that are familiar now and then you know we'll have we'll have a good time when it actually appears that the governments uh, you know again through incremental change through becoming more participatory those sorts of things have have, have really done a, a pretty good job uh, of, of uh, you know smoothing things out a little bit in terms of inequality but you know one of the reasons that, that they do that is because most of the world has been convinced that uh, high inequalities would really be a problem if they were allowed just to go on unchecked. And so for the most part, we do have these kinds of um, pseudo Marxist, uh, you know, or semi Marxist redistribution schemes that are, again, almost globally universal. Uh, just about everybody does things this way. And so, uh, again, Marx's legacy is pretty complicated uh, and it's really hard uh, to decide, you know, what to either blame him for or give him credit for or, or probably both. Um, and uh, but in any case, right, his thought has been tremendously influential uh, in a lot of different areas of, of life. Um, and uh, uh, I think he'd uh, uh, sort of be at least satisfied about that, even if he might be mystified at the world uh, that has uh, in some ways gone very much against his expectations.